Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about valvular heart disease. Um, and there's a few different um, valves that we're going to discuss tonight. Um, but first, we're going to talk about the two types of heart disease. So the two main, of course, heart disease, valve disease. And, you know, the two main types that we talk about is stenosis and regurgitation. And so to differentiate these, when you think stenosis, think of, um, you know, the function of your valves is to get blood moving forward. It's literally kind of like a door that opens and helps, um, you know, project some of that blood forward um, so that you can get perfusion and cardiac output to the rest of your body. Um, so with stenosis, what happens is I get a very narrow, um, you know, passageway to be able to get that blood out. So I can't move blood forward with stenosis because, um, you know, the pathway is too narrow. Kind of think of like a really narrow funnel. Um, with regurgitation, um, it's not that there's a narrow pathway, but what happens is there's backflow. And so my valve isn't functioning right. And so instead of pushing the blood forward, it actually regurgitates it and puts it backwards. So when you're thinking of patients that have regurgitation um, uh, issues at their valves, think heart failure. Um, you know, with stenosis, I always um, like to think that like, you know, the fact that if you have stenosis, you usually can't stand um, because you have decreased cardiac output and you can have like syncope and passing out and regurgitation. You have more of like the respiratory symptoms and a lot of the discomfort that can come with that and um, that backup of fluid and heart failure like symptoms. This can happen to any valve, but the valves that we usually focus on when we talk about valve disease are going to be mitral and aortic valves. And that's the left side of the heart. And of course, the left side of the heart is your powerhouse. That's the side of the heart that's pushing blood out to the rest of your body. So if there's a problem with the valve on the left side of your heart, it's going to cause a major problem um, for your, you getting adequate cardiac output. So let's talk about mitral valve problems. The mitral valve is the valve that's between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Um, and if I'm having stenosis, and again, remember stenosis where it's narrow, it's like a very, very tiny funnel. It can't, um, you know, get blood through. Um, you know, what I'm going to com usually complain about is shortness of breath with activity and fatigue. Now I'm going to tell you with all valve problems, they all really look the same. And that's why it's really hard to differentiate, which is why I'm not a cardiologist. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, these patients are going to go show signs that they are not getting blood out to the rest of their body. Um, because uh, literally it's this narrow um, passageway that it has to, you know, push blood to from the right, uh, left atrium to left ventricle. Um, in mitral regurgitation, think again, those heart failure symptoms where effectively this valve, and you can see kind of in this picture that the mitral valve here, um, what it does is, um, and this is showing stenosis, but um, the same valve, what it does with regurgitation is it pushes blood back. And so if I'm having regurgitation in my mitral valve, and that's the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle, where is blood going? Well, if it's going backwards, it's going up into the left atrium and it's going into the lungs. And so these patients have a lot of respiratory symptoms, difficulty breathing, dyspnea, et cetera. It's really common for patients with this, um, to these type of um, problems with their mitral valve to have atrial fibrillation or other dysrhythmias. Um, and we may also hear an S3 sound. And, um, you know, that's what they call the ventricular gallop. Um, and so that, um, that S3 sound is really common in mitral problems. It's also known as like a dis diastolic murmur. So if I'm having problems with my aortic valve, this is kind of the big deal. What's the aortic valve? That's the valve that literally is the door to get blood out to the rest of your body. So this is the valve between the left ventricle and the rest of the body. And so if, if that is narrow, and look at this picture of how narrow it can be um, with severe stenosis. It, like, look how normal, like it's literally like a circle and it goes to being some sort of, you know, <laughs> very, very small skinny shape. And if that's all I have to get blood out, that's why I say stenosis can't stand. So they have the syncope, the fatigue, you're literally stopping blood from getting out to the rest of your body. So they're really going to feel that. Um, they can also have regurgitation in their aortic valve. And again, think heart failure and then heaving blood vessels. So there's what's called a water hammer pulse. And literally because of that regurgitation, it kind of creates these crazy pulsations. Sometimes you can see it in their neck or sometimes you can see it in their radial pulse where literally it looks like you can see the, like the vessel pushing up, like you're not even touching it. You can see it like it's called, what's called a heave. It's literally pushing up um, and um, causing kind of like a force. I want to say force of nature because, you know, it sounds pretty awesome 
right? So this is not something you want to have, but it sounds pretty cool. Um, you know, when you think about it, like that, that's so much pressure that the, um, because of that regurgitation, it's literally causing kind of this echo effect down all the way to your radial pulses, causing it to have this pulsation. Um, so that's something else you might notice in those patients. Um, this can uh, be an emergency. Um, aortic valve, again, is more serious business. It can end up in cardiogenic shock no cardiac output. Remember, it's all about getting blood out to your body, getting adequate cardiac output and getting that tissue perfusion. Um, with patients with aortic problems, they're going to have a systolic murmur or you're gonna hear an S4 sound. Um, and that's what they call the atrial gallop. So overall, how am I gonna treat this patient? Of course, first I wanna to try to prevent it. And I can try to prevent it, you know, we talked about the infective endocarditis and things like that and a lot of infection processes, the, you know, um, we talked about the rheumatic um, heart disease and things like that, rheumatic um, fever that can come that can lead to valve issues. So I wanna to try to prevent all of those. If I can prevent infection and um, have good dental hygiene to prevent, you know, from um, having kind of those um, cardiac problems after dental work, then um, I can prevent valvular heart disease. And so education is gonna be key. And then also identifying high risk patients um, that are gonna maybe need prophylactic antibiotics before their procedures. If I have regurgitation, I'm gonna treat the fluid overload. So, um, you know, I'm going to give medications that I would give for someone who has like heart failure. So um, vasodilators, positive inotropes, beta blockers, diuretics, a low sodium diet. I'm trying to have less fluid and more output. So I'm trying to decrease the amount of resistance that the um, heart is trying to overcome to get the fluid out. I'm also going to give medications, like I mentioned, a lot of those regurgitation, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the regurgitation also, uh, especially when I'm talking about the mitral valve can cause like dysrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. So if the patient has atrial fibrillation, they're going to need to be on long-term anticoagulation. Um, and they may also need to be, have that dysrhythmia treated, especially if it's unstable. For stenosis, um, in regurgitation, there is also um, surgeries that can be done to try to um, reconstruct that valve. But more often, uh, what do you call it with regurgitation, um, you know, we treat the symptoms and then, you know, we um, sometimes may get a valve replacement. Um, with stenosis, um, you know, more often because that's usually a little bit more serious in the fact that um, literally sometimes like nothing's getting pushed out, especially when we're talking about aortic stenosis, we're going to do procedures to open, repair, or replace. So we can open, we can literally kind of take a balloon and try to, in, you know, it's a really narrow um, area that um, is in that valve. We can try to literally like balloon it open. We can try to repair it um, or we can replace it. And you know, regardless of whether they have regurgitation or stenosis, when we're talking about valve options, there's two options that you can have when you're having a valve replacement. The first is the mechanical valve. And this is what a lot of people get. And if you ever walk by someone, you kind of hear a ticking around them and you're like, where's that ticking coming from? You know, you think of like Peter Pan and you know, <laughs> that shark and, uh, not shark, sorry, um, alligator uh, or crocodile or whatever it was, um, you know, kind of like that weird, like tick, tick, tick sound, like, you know, it's kind of like that. And so uh, my mother-in-law has one and every time I'm around her, I'm like, how do you not hear that. Um, and so, um, but mechanical valves as a whole, they're literally, it's like a mechanical um, piece that's put into your heart. Um, these last longer, but they require lifelong anticoagulation. So like my mother-in-law, um, you know, when she, um, when she needed to get um, her mechanical, uh, her mechanical valve, she was younger. And when I say younger, I don't remember, I think she was in her fifties or sixties. And so because she was in her fifties or sixties, she still has a lot of life left in her. So it made more sense because these last longer and you know she can probably have this the rest of her life and she wasn't high risk for him receiving anticoagulation if someone's high risk for receiving anticoagulation maybe they're pregnant um, or they're high risk of bleeding or maybe they're really a lot older you know like a 90 year old patient to put a mechanical valve in them um, you know because most um, other types of valves can last like 10 years or so it doesn't really make a lot of sense because the risk of them having a fall and bleeding to death from the anticoagulation is probably more than the risk of um uh, what do you call it? So it's better to choose like a different option for them rather than that mechanical valve. So usually mechanical valves are given to people that are younger and that aren't at risk, like high risk for bleeding um, or that can handle that lifelong anticoagulation. Um, the other option is a biological valve. So they can do valves or they have pig valves, they have cow valves, et cetera. And um, I'm sure they're making many, many more options right now as we speak. 
um, but biological valves, um, they last less time. So usually they maybe last like they last over five to 10 years, just depending, um, <clears throat> but they have less risk of complications. Um, and, um, you know, there's no anticoagulation needed. And I mean, it's the same, it's a lot of the same procedure and stuff like that. It's just more the long-term management um, with the biological. There's no clicking because there's no mechanical, like, you know, there's no mechanism that's um, against itself. But again, these don't last as much time. Um, and, um, you know, um, you always have to consider that, like if a patient, um, you know, gets one of these and then, um, you know, they, uh, they need, they're going to ha uh, have to, if they, um, if they get it when they're young, uh, because maybe they are high risk for the anticoagulation, they're going to have to have multiple replacements of these. They do have new, um, less invasive procedures, like what's called the TAVR, the TAVR, which is the transaortic valve replacement, which is where they don't have to go and they don't have to cut your whole chest open to um, replace that valve that's for the aortic valve. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's definitely new technology getting out there because, you know, a lot of patients that have these valve issues, they sometimes need more than one replacement. So what's my role as the nurse for a patient with valve disease? I really want to make sure they're getting adequate cardiac output and um, you know, getting that blood flow out um, to their body, again, tissue perfusion. I want to prevent complications and be um, monitoring for their safety, especially because keep in mind, uh, when people are having valve disease, what are some of the signs and symptoms I told you about? I told you they can have syncope, which means they're literally like passing out, um, like, you know, like uh, they don't have enough cardiac output to support them to the point where their brain is just like, I'm not getting enough output put pass out like I'm not functioning and so we really want to worry about these patients safety and want to protect for them but we also want to protect for their safety because if they get a valve replacement and they're on anticoagulation I want to prevent any sort of trauma they need to avoid contact sports they need to make sure not to use straight razors they need to use electric razors they need to stay away from other things that are going to make them bleed um, we want to try to decrease the amount of sticks we're going to do to them I want to use smaller gauge needles if possible protect them from injury and make sure they know to report any bleeding that they experience you know um, it's never like expected like hey your your gum you're, you're going to start bleeding from every orifice and that's okay <laughs> no you know if they start bleeding they need to make sure that they tell their doctor um, we also again um, with everything cardiac related we're going to be worried about their energy conservation or their exercise tolerance we want to improve their quality of life and their ability to care for themselves so um, I'm going to try to work with them on that and teach them those energy conservation techniques um, and then I'm going to treat the symptoms you know if this patient's struggling to breathe struggling to do activities struggling to get comfortable you know I want to do whatever I can to um, you know there might be cardiac rehab or other resources I can connect them with and then also give them medications to treat some of those symptoms that they're experiencing. So um, that is valve disorders. And as always, I hope that this was helpful and I'll see you next time.